Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we're going to be watching the first part of Napoleon's Marshals by Epic History TV. Uh, I know you guys have been uh, excited for this one. Uh, I've seen all your comments. I'm going to be watching this in the parts they release them in because the full video is roughly three hours long. So uh, that would be quite a long reaction. Um, disclaimer on this one, there is a storm going on outside, so if you hear any extraneous background noise, uh, that's why. I'm excited to get into this video, uh, learn a bit more about Napoleon's marshals, maybe flesh out my knowledge of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. Mm. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. That year, he picked 18 of France's best generals and made them marshals of the empire. Eight more were created in the years that followed. I'm glad we're getting a bit of background on the position of Marshall because, you know, I'm not too familiar with military history or, you know, French military history. And of course, Marshall is not a position that you find uh, in a lot of militaries. So it's sort of interesting to hear the background. And it's unsurprising that it would have been abolished during the French Revolution. Uh, a lot of hierarchy was abolished um, and a lot of things were leveled to a certain extent. Um, but then, of course, Napoleon would bring back a lot of that traditional hierarchy. The marshals outranked everyone in the new empire, apart from Napoleon's family, princes, and ministers of state. Hmm. They came from every background, sons of aristocrats and innkeepers, professional soldiers, and those who'd learned on the job, old school Republicans, and Bonaparte loyalists. Yeah. Well, and this is something we see in both the French Revolution and under Napoleon. There's a lot of opportunity to those who would not otherwise uh, have experienced opportunities in the Ancien Regime. Um, so, you know, the French Revolution abolishes noble titles and opens up a lot of positions to non-noble Frenchmen. Uh, in addition, of course, a lot of aristocrats in France had either been executed or killed. And so a lot of political and military positions were opened up uh, due to their deaths. And so there were a lot of new opportunities open uh, to often middle class or even lower class uh, Frenchmen. Uh, and under Napoleon, of course, Napoleon rose from a fairly middle class background to, uh, you know, his position. And so I would imagine that he was open to seeing talent wherever he could find it. The youngest just half the age of the oldest. Wow. And though Marshal was a civil title, not strictly a military rank, the men known to the army as Les Gros Bonnets, the Big Hats, hmm. were arguably the most extraordinary, diverse, brilliant, and flawed group of military commanders in history. Wow, okay. The most favored were showered with titles and wealth. But the price too was high. Half were wounded, three were killed or died of wounds. Two were executed. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals, hmm. with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. For okay, and... Of course, I'm sure a lot of you guys have opinions on the rankings presented, since a lot of you guys are uh, really into uh, Napoleonic history. Um, 
you know, I know a bit about it. I know more after watching this series, but, you know, uh, I, I do not have the expertise to rank or judge uh, a lot of opinions on how successful each of these men were. So I'm interested to hear uh, some of your comments and your opinions on these different figures uh, and, and how they've been ranked. First, a thank you to our sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online PV. All right, you guys know the deal. Go check out Epic History TV's video. I will link it down below. Um, you know, go give them a like, go show some support, uh, and go check out their sponsor. We want to show some love to the original creator of this video. Available only for 30 days. More than 2,000 French generals served in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Many were brilliant leaders. A few probably deserved to be marshals, more than some who were. Mm. Any selection can only be difficult and highly subjective, but here's our pick of 12 of the best. Bertrand, Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp, who commanded 4th Corps at the Battle of Leipzig. Clausel, a veteran commander of the war in Spain. Dessay, Napoleon's close friend, killed at Marengo, aged 31. Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, a hero of the Russian retreat. Mm. Gérard, one of Napoleon's best corps commanders by 1814, made a marshal by King Louis-Philippe in 1830. Goudon, whose infantry division bore the brunt of the fighting at Auerstedt in 1806, died of wounds near Smolensk in 1812. Junot, who first served with Napoleon at Toulon in 1793, probably committed suicide after his fall from favour in 1813. La Salle, the Hussar general, among the best light cavalry commanders of the Napoleonic Wars, killed at Wagram, aged 34. Maison, who told his division on the morning of Leipzig that they must win that day or all be killed, made marshal by King Charles X in 1829. Non Souti, the heavy cavalry... Okay, interesting. So... We're also considering men who were not marshals at the time, but would later uh, become marshals because Maison was given that position much later, uh, according to what they just said, at least. Cavalry commander who died of wounds and exhaustion, aged 46. Saint Hilaire, hero of Austerlitz, died of wounds received at Aspern in 1809. Van Damme, of whom Napoleon once said, if I had to invade hell, I'd want him commanding the vanguard. Hmm. And now, Napoleon's 26 marshals ranked in order of merit. 26. Marshal okay. Perignon. Here we go. Uh, we're beginning the series, and we're starting with, uh, apparently, the worst of the worst. <laughs> when Napoleon created the first 18 marshals, Four were honorary marshals, recognized for past service to France. Mm. Perignon was one of these. Okay. A former officer in the Royal Army, he'd won fame in the Revolutionary Wars, fighting the Spanish on the Pyrenees front. He later served as ambassador to Spain. After a brief retirement, he was sent to Italy and commanded the French left wing at the disastrous Battle of Novi, where the army was routed by Suvorov's Russians and Perignon was badly wounded and captured. His appointment as Honorary Marshal in 1804 was a political move by Napoleon, mm. a way to win acceptance for his new empire, by emphasizing continuity with the revolution, by rewarding its military heroes. Okay. Perignon never held active command as a marshal, but served as governor of Parma, and later Naples. His eldest son, Pierre, was a cavalry officer, killed at Friedland in 1807. Perignon retired in 1813, but refused to support Napoleon when he returned from exile in 1815 and was stripped of his marshal's baton. His rank was later restored by King Louis XVIII. Of course. Okay, so, you know, 
not much negative to say about Perignon. He wasn't, uh, he didn't serve seemingly actively in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so, more of a political pick, which I suppose is why he's in dead last, not due to his own incompetence or failures, just due to the nature of his position. So, yeah, okay. 25. Marshal Broom. Broon was another marshal whose appointment owed much to politics. Mm. As a fiery Republican and former close ally of revolutionary leader Georges Danton, his support was politically useful for Napoleon. Yeah, Danton was um, a popular leader during the revolution. He was very much uh, a man of the people. Uh, that's what made him popular, made him famous. Um, and, and he was a radical figure, but when and you know he had participated in the terror but at a certain point Danton was one of the figures who uh, wanted to start moderating things to start you know using less terror less executions uh, and he himself was executed for that Brun joined the army during the terror the mm. most extreme period of the revolution his political connections ensured rapid promotion and he was sent to help put down a counter-revolutionary revolt in Bordeaux. And a note on, you know, he was, Brune was politically active, uh, and they mentioned that his connections allowed him to secure, uh, you know, a position in the military. That is how a lot of it worked during the revolutionary period, um, because like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the... Uh, top figures of the military of the Ancien Regime were from the aristocracy, and a lot of them had been executed or fled the country. Um, and so there were a lot of open positions, and one of the ways in which you could get a position in the military was, you know, not necessarily competence, although a lot of competent young men did rise through the ranks, but political allegiance to the current regime. Um, <coughs> political loyalty was pretty important in this period. So oftentimes, regardless of how skilled uh, a man was, if he was loyal to the government, particularly the Jacobin government, he would find himself in a position of power. Um, you know, at least until something went wrong and, you know, he, he slipped up and then was executed during the terror. It was also a very dangerous time. In 1795, as a 30-year-old brigadier general, he helped Napoleon disperse a royalist mob in Paris with mm. the famous whiff of grape shot. <clears throat> right. And this was one of the events that uh, brought Napoleon a lot of popularity and a, and a, a level of fame uh, and some favor with the government as he managed to, uh, you know, control this crowd of royalists, uh, you know, with his talent as an artilleryman using as they mentioned, grape shot. So that was a pretty seminal moment in Napoleon's career, his early career. Brune then served with Napoleon in Italy, fighting in several of his famous early victories. He won a reputation as a fierce divisional commander and mm. enthusiastic plunderer of Italian towns and churches. <laughs> in 1798, he commanded the French occupation of Switzerland while extorting 200,000 francs from the wealthy Swiss communes the equivalent of several million dollars today. Swell guy. It was said that Brun's personal carriage was so laden with gold when it left Switzerland that it immediately broke down. <laughs> Jeez. The next year, he won his most important victory while commanding French forces in Holland, defeating an Anglo-Russian army at the Battle of Castricum and saving France from invasion. But a short, calamitous spell commanding the army of Italy convinced Napoleon that Brune was not fit for high command. Mm. Instead, he sent him to be ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, where in mm. 1804, he learned that he'd been made a marshal. But Brune's lack of delicacy, combined with a towering sense of self-importance, did not make him a successful diplomat. Yeah. He was recalled to France, but as governor of the Hanseatic ports, blundered again, drafting a treaty with Sweden that failed to make any mention of the French Emperor. Whether 
Man, it seems like Brun was having a lot of uh, success earlier on, but uh, he seems to be uh, struggling now. A deliberate insult or act of incompetence, Napoleon was furious, and Brun was sacked. Brun spent the next seven years at his country estate. He bitterly opposed the return of the Bourbon monarchy in 1814, and rallied to Napoleon when he returned from exile the next year. But in the tumult following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, Brun was cornered by a royalist mob in Avignon, murdered, and tossed into the River Rhone. I mean, seems like he would have been a rather controversial figure, particularly among royalists, so... You know, it's unsurprising that's the way he went out. He managed to survive a lot longer than uh, many other politicians who participated in the terror. So there you go. 24. Marshal Serrurier. Serrurier was another of the four honorary marshals whom Napoleon wished to recognize for past service. Mm. In contrast to Brune, Serrurier was a professional soldier of the old school. And you'll notice that. Uh, I, these honorary marshals have generally been maybe a little bit on the older side, especially this guy born in 1742. Uh, he was of uh, an older generation than a lot of the military men we're going to be seeing in this series. A veteran of the Seven Years' War and a stern disciplinarian. This background was not necessarily an asset during the French Revolution, when right. any officer who'd served in the Royal Army was viewed with suspicion. But Colonel Serrurier's training and diligence were soon recognized as assets to the new French Republic. Mm. By 1795, he was a general serving with Napoleon in Italy, where his stand against corruption and looting won him the nickname the Virgin of Italy. Hmm. Serrurier was a reliable, if unspectacular, commander. Uh, he gives me the impression of one of those military men who, you know, keeps his head down, uh, does his job, and does it well, um, but, you know, isn't too flashy, and doesn't necessarily get involved in politics too much. Um, perhaps that's how he managed to make it through the revolution in the first place, um, despite his position in the army of the Ancien Regime. I imagine he sort of kept his head down and, and kept at his job who won an important <clears throat> victory at Mondovi, at a crucial moment in Napoleon's rise to fame. The following year, he accepted the Austrian surrender at the end of the long siege of Mantua. Two years later, fighting under General Moreau's command, Serrurier and his division were cut off by the Russians and forced to surrender. Mm. Released on parole, he was back in Paris in time to support Napoleon's coup d'etat of 18 Brumaire. Serrurier then retired from active command. But Napoleon, remembering his past service, made him an honorary marshal and governor of Les Invalides, the retirement home and hospital for old soldiers. Hmm. There, shortly before the fall of Paris in 1814, Serrurier oversaw the burning of more than a thousand captured flags and standards mm. to prevent them falling into Allied hands. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, another marshal who is at the back of the group, not because of his failings, but just because he didn't play too much of an active role in Napoleon's conquests. 23. Marshal Kellerman. Okay. Kellerman was another honorary marshal, right. the oldest at 68, and oh, famed yeah. throughout France as the savior of the revolution. A career mm. soldier from a middle-class background, he'd seen distinguished service as a cavalry officer in the Seven Years' War. At the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, he was a general, commanding a frontier army at the moment of greatest crisis, when it seemed foreign invasion was about to stamp out the revolution and restore the Ancien Régime. But at Valmy, 
In September 1792, Kellerman's Army of the Centre stood its ground, and with a ferocious artillery barrage, persuaded the Prussian army to withdraw. Ah, okay, so, uh, yeah, that explains a lot. Valmy was an extremely important battle in the French Revolution, um, and also on Kellerman, uh, you know, I would assume that his middle-class background probably had something to do with him keeping his job, but also, if he was, um, you know, involved in this battle, uh, at this point, France was, you know, desperately threatened by external enemies, uh, it seemed like everything was at risk of falling apart, um, you know, they weren't sure if they could even stand up to a foreign army, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, military men throughout Europe thought that the French army had just been wrecked by the revolution, and then it comes to the Battle of Valmy, and the French, uh, you know, deal a decisive defeat to the Prussians, not because they actually had a real battle, but, you know, they, the French and the Prussians come face to face, and it's kind of contested what really happened here, but the French army is very enthusiastic, there's an artillery barrage, they're yelling and screaming, and the Prussians basically disengage. Um, so it ended up not being much of a battle, but it was a massive morale boost to France, and it was a really important early victory for France. Um, so yeah, and of course, that would uh, definitely improve Kellerman's reputation. Valmy was not a stunning tactical victory, but it was a turning point of history right. that saved the infant French Republic. Yeah. When the revolution took a more radical turn, even a war hero like Kellerman became suspected of royalist links mm. and spent a year in prison under the threat of the guillotine. Acquitted and restored to command, he was poised to launch a new offensive in Italy when he was sidelined, first by General Scherer, then in favour of a rising new talent, hmm. General Bonaparte. Kellerman later specialised in army administration and training, a role he continued to perform under Napoleon, whilst also entering politics and serving as President of the Senate. Hmm. His son, General Francois Etienne Kellerman, followed in his father's footsteps, serving as one of Napoleon's best cavalry commanders. Okay, so another older, you know, well-respected fella who uh, didn't play an active role in the Napoleonic Wars, um, but did play an active role in the Revolutionary Wars and, um, you know, was made a hero for it. Though, as you saw, uh, that was not enough to prevent you from being arrested, uh, and he's frankly lucky he wasn't executed because, you know, many important and well-loved men like Danton were executed. Um, so yeah, uh, another guy who is, you know, uh, at the back of this group of marshals, but not due to his own failure. 22. Marshal Grouchy. Now, Grouchy, there's a figure that we have seen uh, in the Napoleonic Wars videos. Um, so he, he was more active than the guys we've seen so far. When Napoleon returned from his first exile in 1815, he created one last marshal for the upcoming campaign, mm. Emmanuel de Grouchy. Although now infamous for failing to march to Napoleon's aid during the Battle of Waterloo, up to that moment, Grouchy had had a long and distinguished military career. An aristocrat who embraced the French Revolution, Grouchy served with distinction throughout the Revolutionary Wars, fighting counter-revolutionaries in the Vendée and serving in Italy, where he was wounded and captured at the Battle of Novi. Under the Empire, Grouchy excelled as commander of a dragoon division in... Yeah, I would say, once again, Grouchy was you know, lucky to make it through the revolution unscathed, although perhaps his service in the Vendée contributed to that, um, you know, him fighting uh, counter-revolutionaries perhaps signified his loyalty to the revolution, though uh, I won't get into it now, but, you know, the revolt in the Vendée was a very 
brutal conflict, uh, very brutally put down by the revolutionary government. Marshal Murat's cavalry reserve. He was praised by the Emperor for his part in the great French charge at Eylau, played an important role buying time for Napoleon at Friedland, mm. and expertly covered the French right wing at Wagram. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded 3rd Cavalry Corps and was wounded at Borodino. He survived the horrors of the retreat, but was left so exhausted it took him several months to recover. He returned for Napoleon's 1814 campaign in France and was wounded twice more. Grouchy was made a marshal at the start of the Hundred Days campaign and commanded Napoleon's right wing at Ligny. After the battle was won, he was ordered to pursue the retreating Prussians to prevent them joining up with Wellington's Anglo-Allied army. Two days later, as the Battle of Waterloo raged ten miles to the west, Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders, rather yep. than march to join Napoleon, and has been widely blamed for the French Emperor's defeat ever since. Grouchy's vilification is not wholly fair, not least because Napoleon rarely encouraged his marshals to show initiative, and often flew into rages if they deviated from his written orders. Nor should one blunder obscure the distinguished record of one of the Grande Armée's best cavalry generals. Grouchy fled to America after Napoleon's defeat to escape royalist reprisals, hmm. but was pardoned and returned to France in 1820. Still at the back, though of the active generals. Um, yeah, like they said, he's one of those guys who, uh, his career was defined by one moment, uh, you know, one failure, um, and that's what he's been known for ever since. Um, you know, unfairly, because he had a whole career outside of that, um, and, you know, Epic History TV just stated that, though despite that, he's still at the back of the active generals, though that may just... Uh, tell us that the rest are the active generals, the active marshals. Though uh, that may just tell us that uh, the rest of them are, you know, are an impressive bunch. 21. Marshal Monsey. Okay, an honest man. Monsey ran away from home to join the army at the age of 15. After 20 years of uneventful service, he'd risen no higher than the rank of captain. Mm. But then came the French Revolution. Most French officers were aristocrats, who, if they did not actively oppose the revolution, were nevertheless regarded as politically suspect. Yep. The result was that three quarters of them either fled the country or were dismissed from the army. Exactly. Monsey, a middle-class officer with no strong political views, reap the benefit. Yeah, and Monse was the type of guy who would rise up during the revolution, um, partially because of all the openings in uh, the high ranks of the military, um, and partially because, you know, during the Ancien Regime, um, a lot of positions were blocked off to those who were not of nobility, and so you know, middle-class individuals, even if they were competent and talented, would struggle to rise to the top. And the revolution obviously got rid of that. Um, for Monse, it seems uh, less of that and more that there was just a lot of positions. Um, and he managed to take advantage of that. With meteoric promotion. By 1794, General Monse was leading the army of the Western Pyrenees to victory over the Spanish. Nice. on what was, admittedly, a relative backwater of the Revolutionary Wars. Mm. In 1797, he was dismissed for alleged Royalist sympathies, but reinstated in time to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire. Mm. By his own admission, Monsey was a sensitive officer. Honest, honourable, but lacking a ruthless streak or iron will to succeed. Napoleon was aware of his limitations as a general, but made him a marshal in 1804, as part okay. of his emphasis on continuity between the Republic and his new empire. Monsey was appointed Inspector General of the Gendarmerie, 
France's militarized police force, and mm. spent most of the rest of his career commanding reserve troops. He only held one field command again. In light of his victorious record against the Spanish, he was given command of a corps for the 1808 invasion of Spain, operating in the south of the country with mixed success. In 1809, he was replaced by General Junot and mm. returned to France. Monse's finest hour came in the dying days of the Empire, leading the National Guard of Paris in a courageous but doomed defence of the French capital. In 1815, the restored King of France, Louis XVIII, ordered Marshal Monse to preside at the trial of Marshal Ney for treason. Mm. Monse regarded Ney as a hero for having saved so many French lives in Russia, and refused, declaring, If I am not allowed to save my country nor my own life, then at least I will save my honour. I mean, regardless of anything else, at least, Monse seems like a respectable guy, you know? Seems like he's, uh, he's got his principles in check. Um, so, you know, props to him for, for that. After a short spell in prison, Monse was allowed to resume his military career, becoming governor of Les Invalides, in which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St. Helena in 1840. Mm. At the end of the ceremony, the 86-year-old Marshal Monse announced, and now, let us go home to die. <laughs> Yeah, so Monse, though he did serve actively under Napoleon, he, he seems like a, a bit more of a political choice again. You know, he was chosen to maintain uh, continuity, though he seemed like a pretty respectable guy. Seems like he followed his conscience wherever it took him. So, you know, respect. 20. Marshal Poniatowski. Prince Józef Poniatowski was the King of Poland's nephew, but his military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army, even serving as aide-de-camp to Emperor Józef II himself. In 1789, he transferred... And this is the first mention of the Poles that we've gotten. Um, and I'm not sure if there were other Poles amongst this group, but the Poles were an important contingent uh, among Napoleon's forces um, because... You know, during the Napoleonic Wars, they were fighting for the independence of their country, so they had a lot to lose. So Poland was an important part of the whole conflict. Heard to the Polish army with the rank of Major General, but could not save Poland from partition by its rapacious neighbours, Russia, Prussia and Austria. Mm -hmm. By 1795, Poland had vanished from the map, swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat of Prussia in 1806, Poniatowski decided loyal service to the French Emperor was the best way to win Poland's restoration, mm. although he never fully trusted Napoleon's aims. Fair. Somber, serious and brave, Poniatowski proved an able commander of Duchy of Warsaw forces in Napoleon's service. When war broke out with Austria in 1809, while Napoleon advanced on Vienna, Poniatowski waged a brilliant supporting campaign against a larger Austrian army in Galicia. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded the Polish V Corps. He and his troops distinguished themselves first at Smolensk and again at Borodino, leading the attack on the right wing. All right. Poniatowski and his corps performed heroically throughout the campaign motivated in part by their old animosity towards Russia. <laughs> but yeah. by the end of the retreat, Fifth Corps had been virtually destroyed. Poniatowski remained loyal to Napoleon, even though the disaster in Russia paved the way for the Russian reoccupation of Poland. He rejoined Napoleon in Germany in 1813 and was given command of the Polish Eighth Corps. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, he was made a marshal by Napoleon, in recognition right. of his service and to inspire his Polish troops. Poniatowski was the only non-Frenchman to receive this honour. 
Uh, okay. Well, my question is answered for me. Uh, he's the only non-Frenchman we will see in this role, but as I mentioned, and as you can see from his career, um, you know, Polish soldiers were an important part of Napoleon's army, um, and though, you know, they mentioned that Poniatowski didn't completely trust Napoleon, which I think uh, is fair, you know, he's got different goals than you do, at the end of the day, you know, as he knew, and a lot of the Poles knew, um, it was probably the best chance to create and maintain an independent Polish nation. Um, though, you know, the Duchy of Warsaw was not actually independent. It was a French puppet state. Um, but I suppose that's better than being completely absorbed by your hostile neighbors. It was the best chance that Poland had. Um, and we can see that from the fact that, you know, after Napoleon lost and the wars ended... Um, Poland would not get another chance, um, and, you know, Poland would not exist as an independent country for a long time. He and his troops fought with their usual tenacity and skill at Leipzig, holding key villages on the southern front against the Austrian and Prussian onslaught. At the end of the battle, Poniatowski commanded part of the rear guard, but their only escape route bridge over the Elster River was blown up too soon. Mm. Badly wounded, Poniatowski tried to escape by riding his horse across the river, but he was swept from his saddle and drowned. He had been a marshal for just four days. Wow. In the short term, Poniatowski's loyalty to France achieved nothing, as following Napoleon's defeat, Russia occupied Poland for the next century. Yep. But Poniatowski's legend lived on, a model of Polish patriotism that inspired future generations. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he would be, um, you know, a, a venerated hero in many ways. Um, not successful in the end, but definitely representative of Polish nationhood um, and Polish patriotism, which, uh, you know, in terms of nationalism and patriotism, the Poles were pretty, uh, you know, early to the game. I think mainly because they really had something to fight for. You know, they were forced to fight for their nation, uh, the existence of their nation. Uh, and as covered, unfortunately, they were not successful. Um, and, you know, Poland would be under the control of Russia. So, you know, unfortunate, but, um, you know, you can't hit on Poniatowski for trying. And it seems like he was a fairly uh, competent marshal. 19. Marshal Jourdain. Hmm. As a young French private, Jourdain saw combat in Georgia during the American Revolutionary War. Huh. But he then caught a fever that led to his discharge and plagued him for the rest of his life. Mm. When the French Revolution began, he was elected captain of his local National Guard unit fought at the battles of Jemap and Honschauter, and was rapidly promoted to general. Nice. In 1794, he made his name defeating coalition forces at the Battle of Fleurus. This was a crucial victory of the Revolutionary War, which handed France control of Belgium for 20 years. It was also notable for the French army's use of balloon reconnaissance, the <laughs> first effective use of an aircraft in military history. Well, there you Jourdan go. Jourdan became a prominent politician under the Directory, lending his name to a law that formalized France's policy of mass conscription. Uh. As a committed Republican, Jourdan refused to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, but his fame as the victor of Fleurus was enough to ensure he became a marshal in 1804. Hmm. Jourdan was on good terms with Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph. When Joseph became King of Spain in 1808, Jourdan went with him as his military advisor. Well, I guess that shows you the uh, respect and pre prestige that Jourdan must have had, in that despite originally opposing Napoleon uh, as a committed Republican, which, as you may know, we've had some other Republicans who did not oppose Napoleon, he still managed to uh, become a marshal uh, and, uh, you know, be buddies with Joseph. So, Jourdan must have been pretty well respected. 
but the situation in Spain would prove beyond Jourdan's military skills to solve. Yeah. He faced stubborn resistance from the Spanish and Portuguese, supported by the British, and an equally stubborn refusal to cooperate from other French marshals in Spain, hmm. theoretically under Jourdan's command, but who repeatedly ignored his orders and openly questioned his competence. Yikes. Marshal Soult in Andalusia was a prime offender, while Marshal Victor's insubordination at the Battle of Talavera contributed directly to the French defeat. Struck by another bout of ill health, Jourdan went home to recover. I mean, to be fair to Jourdan, uh, I'm not sure that even a competent, a more competent marshal who had had the complete uh, loyalty of his subordinates would have been able to save the French position in Spain. Um, you know, it, it was a pretty bad spot for the French to be in. Two years later, he returned to Spain. But at the Battle of Vitoria in 1813, he and King Joseph were outmaneuvered and decisively beaten by Wellington, yeah. leading to the collapse of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. Jourdan never held a major command again, but mm. his 20 years of service and evident patriotism were widely recognized and respected. Okay. He was made a peer by Napoleon, a count by Louis XVIII, and died in 1833 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan. Eight down, 18 to go. Hmm. Join us for part two, when we'll continue the countdown. Coming soon. All right. Um, I presume the video's done now. Thank you to call- Yes, of course. Um, okay, that was an interesting one. I'm actually quite excited to continue. Um, you know, in terms of the rankings, these are the guys who were ranked worst. But, uh, and I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, you know, these men, regardless of their achievements or failures, were all uh, marshals uh, serving under Napoleon. So, you know, clearly these are all men of some great skill. Um, or they were put there for a reason, right? And so even among this group, who are the worst of the bunch, according to this ranking, like I said, I'm sure some of you guys have opinions on the way that they've ranked this. Apart from Grouchy, who is well known, perhaps unfairly, for his mistake at Waterloo, you didn't really see too many, like, terrible... Uh, marshals here, you know, making terrible mistakes or, or, you know, just not living up to the position. I mean, a lot of these guys were given the position for political reasons and they didn't serve that much uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. So th that that's kind of what characterized this group. Uh, and then a couple of, you know, I'd say a group of fairly respectable individuals, uh, you know, guys like Monsey, who... Uh, seems to, uh, like I said, he had his principles and he followed them, and guys like Poniatowski who fought for his country. So yeah, uh, a pretty interesting group, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited to continue the series. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, then I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out the Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope all you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.